I went to the VA to uh, head up the substance abuse program because my background was in drugs. And uh, in fact, when I was at Fort Sam Houston, was, excuse me, Fort Benning, my last assignment in the Army, I was the post officer who was in charge of alcohol and drug abuse. I was supposed to sort of uh, provide guidance along those lines. And um, I was asked to give a speech in San Antonio on a previous assignment about the drug war and all the drug problems that were escalating. This is back in 70, 72, I guess, before all the uh, physicians in Bear County, Texas, that San Antonio area. And I presented slides showing how the epidemics were going uphill with heroin, et cetera. And I said, you know, this is drug war, but it doesn't seem to be stopping the drugs from coming into the country. They only stop about 10%, so maybe we should be looking at some other approach to this drug problem. But I only threw that in as part of my talk. Well, that was enough to turn off everyone. Uh, they figured I was probably a pro-drug guy or something, and they, no one hung around to talk to me afterwards except one person. So I guess all through the, uh, my career, I've probably been out of step with the official doctrine about drugs. And uh, after organizing uh, the substance abuse program at the VA and at UCLA, and teaching at UCLA for about three years, I went into private practice and did that for a while in a variety of circumstances, and then went from there to well, I guess you'd say retirement or semi-retirement, and we decided to move after the big earthquake up to Tehachapi, a small town near Bakersfield. And while there, I uh, had some health problems, but I recovered, and they needed a psychiatrist in their rural health clinic, so Judy's a nurse, a psychiatric nurse. We both went to work for them for three years. And then we came up here just in the last uh, three years. But meanwhile, I had started work on a book, and I'd like to mention why I did that. Um, one of the reasons was that there had been so much misinformation given to the public over the years that they had formed some very erroneous conclusions about the Army. They thought the Army was in league with the CIA, for example, which it was not. Uh, they thought that DZ was a terrible drug that would just cause everyone to go totally crazy, and they put out this film, Jacob's Ladder, uh, which was a ludicrous uh, portrayal of what DZ would do. And the director, the producer admitted, he said, but we needed to get more dramatic effects. So they had Tim Robbins lying in the bathtub with his eyes rolled back, you know, and this was supposed to be the result of getting this gas somehow. Uh, that was one thing. And the other thing was the 9-11 uh, 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 disaster, which caused a lot of increased interest in chemical weapons. And we feared, or many people feared, we'd be subject to chemical weaponry. Um, I point out in the book that chemical warfare really isn't a very practical form of warfare. Uh, it's very hard to get any amount of any kind of incapacitating uh, or lethal gas over any large area. Uh, it's just logistically impossible. An example of that was in uh, Japan a few years ago uh, when some members of a cult uh, put sarin in the uh, subway system. Well, only eight people died, 1,200 escaped and were a little bit sick but recovered fully so you can see that this was not a weapon of mass destruction even in a closed space like the yeah. subway system. So that was the thing I wanted to kind of allay some fears about. By the way, we have a treatment for nerve agents. We have a treatment also for BZ which we developed and which is now used in emergency rooms to treat uh, delirium caused by belladonna drugs, which are closely related to BZ. So we made a little contribution there. Um, what would be your next question?
at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the early drugs that the army was interested in was marijuana. Uh, of course, the substance in marijuana is potent, but not as potent as it would have to be to be used as a weapon. Uh, it might get a lot of people high, but you know it wouldn't necessarily make them unable to function. Uh, however, a chemist who was working on contract for the Army came up with a, um, a modification of THC. Uh, before that, though, I should, should have, well, I just kind of skipped something. Um, rather than use uh, THC itself, they found that they could, you know, boil uh, marijuana plants in alcohol and then reduce them down to the substance that was left over, which would be kind of a I guess a hash-like material, and they call that red oil because it's still uh, a liquid, and that was potent, but not as potent as it needed to be. So, this modification that came along from a chemist working for the army uh, was called EA twenty-two thirty-three, and it was just like tetrahydrocannabinol with a couple of extra methyl groups off to the side, and that increased its potency and duration. And we tested it in, I tested it in about, uh, in 12 volunteers at 10 levels of dosage, going up to a total of five milligrams. And they, they didn't have the expected ill effects, uh, not ill effects, but the incapacitating effects. Uh, the one man at the highest dose, as I described in my book, uh, he got uh, quite a mellow high out of it, and I was, interviewing him and he said he he wasn't worried about anything he'd be glad to do it again and he'd never smoked marijuana and as had, neither had any of the other volunteers for the most part because back then it was still a street drug not an army drug this was 61 later on uh, Fred Seidel who was a colleague of mine uh, tested the individual isomers of EA-2233, of which there are eight because of the stereo uh, points that you can branch into two possibilities, so two times three different locations is two to the third, eight different possible stereo isomers, and uh, found that the isomer two and four were the most potent, but they lowered the blood pressure so much that the individuals weren't able to stand. They had to lie down. And so this looked like it might be a dangerous drug to keep studying, and they stopped. Looking back on it, uh, it seems to me that they might have passed up the greatest opportunity to have a drug that wouldn't kill anyone, would just make them have to lie down. And if you're lying down, you can't do much of a military uh, activity. And then when it wore, out, wore off, uh, they would be fine, and it wouldn't have killed anyone. Well, anyway, all that work we did in the 60s was more or less relegated to file cabinets in some back room. The Army didn't want to talk about it. Uh, a number of the studies that were written for the laboratory and it were classified were declassified, but no one was interested in, you know, publicizing this for some reason. And I felt there should be a summary, there should be a summary of the story of what we did in the 60s, because 7,000 volunteers passed through this program in a 20-year period, most of them in the 60s, and the public didn't even know about it anymore. It's they're buried deep in, in the past, the ashes of uh, forgotten history.